everyone. My name is Alana McGovern Register and I'm the curator here at Silver Plume Exhibitions. Today we are really excited to have Mark Hallett back with us to uh, show us how to draw a saber-toothed cat. Now this is the third session uh, in our series and so if you haven't seen it, check out our website spexhibitions.com and under the additional programming tab you'll find the other two sessions. Uh, so you can go through those, get uh, practiced on drawing your cat up to this point. And then today, Mark is going to teach us how to add some color to our drawings. So we're really excited um, to have Mark with us again. So thank you so much, Mark. I will stop the share and let you take over. Give us a little materials list. Okay, thanks, Alana. Welcome everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to be able to uh, have you here again. As you remember, I spoke last time about using what I call dry materials uh, to create a rendering or a sketch of a saber-toothed cat. And this was using uh, dark pencil, dark soft pencil, and then also Conte stick or Conte crayon as it's sometimes called. This time we're going to be working with wet materials, uh, brushes and paints. And the kind of paints that I am going to be using, which you may use or you uh, or you may not want to, but you certainly can try, are the ones that are called designer's colors, or in French, they're called gouache. And these are basically very opaque, very thick watercolors, which can be diluted way down to a very uh, transparent kind of a uh, uh, wash, very similar to the little Prang watercolor sets that we all had as kids that we worked with. Uh, and then a variety of different brushes some of my brushes are, uh, are uh, pretty old, but they still work very well. If you take care of your brushes, of course, they'll still work wonderfully for you uh, for years and years. Uh, but uh, in terms of the types of paints that I'm using, I have a variety of uh, paints beginning with opaque white. I also have uh, a variety of earth tone colors like the sepia. Uh, and then I have um, uh, yet another color, Payne's Gray, which I use instead of black. And the reason I suggest using the um, color called Payne's Gray, that's P-A-Y-N-E apostrophe S gray, is that it's not really a gray looking color. It looks like black, but it's not because it's actually made of um, ultramarine blue with um, with a little uh, red in it. And it will give you the darkest darks, but it will not have the deadening um, sort of uh, light trap qualities that a true black would. This is why a lot of uh, painters don't actually like to use a real black when they paint, because the black actually just sucks up all the light, uh, so to speak. So if you use the paints gray, show you a close up here spite of all the smudges on it. Um, this is uh, the best substitute for it. So in addition to this color, I'm using a variety of uh, colors, uh, warm uh, kind of earth tones, which you'd expect when you're doing a uh, subject like a uh, prehistoric animal. But also oddly enough, um, I'm using um, a type of green called Viridian green. Here it is here. That's V-I-R-D-I-A-N green. It's a cool green. I also am using um, a type of uh, violet, and this could be any violet you want. Um, it's called um, whoops, spectrum violet. Now, why would I be using green and violet? These seem like very strange colors to be using with an organic subject like a prehistoric cat. Well, basically, the reason I'm using these colors as well as the organic colors are that to the human eye, cool colors, which are achieved by mixing in uh, cool tone paints like green and purple, appear to have the quality of making shapes recede, whereas warm colors such as orange or uh, yellow ochre make parts of the uh, parts of the object that are closest to the eye come forward. So it's sort of reinforcing in our brains through the use of color, what we're trying to achieve with tonality to make things pop out, to look around, to come forward from the flat shape that we're uh, 
that we're using here. So these are the kind of colors I'm gonna be using. Uh, what I wanna do with these colors is to actually start by creating a, what I call a monochromatic rendering or a monotone rendering. I've started off with my contour uh, with a little bit of shading here to give it some dimensionality so you can see where I'm starting from. But um, I'm also gonna be using uh, some props. Uh, I'll just show these to you really quickly. One of them is the actual skull, uh, not the real skull, but a cast of a skull of a saber-toothed cat. And this is life-size. It was created by molding a real skull and then using uh, uh, polyester resin or plastic to create a perfect version of the shape. And everything is there, every little... Uh, every little foramen, uh, foramen and other things that are uh, part of the skull. And then also, we have a model, and I'll switch our view a little bit, which I created for a series of lectures I gave about prehistoric cats. And this is actually uh, life-size, and it's based uh, on a model skull that you can partly see. So this is the uh, muscular version of the head of a saber-toothed cat. For the eyes, I sent to a taxidermist and I bought uh, Bengal tiger eyes. So this is what helps create the illusion of reality in this. I'm also turning it around so that you can see what I eventually did with the model, which was to actually to, uh, the ear should actually be up here, uh, use the uh, synthetic skin to create a, uh, a version of the animal in life along with the taxidermy eyes. I also went over the fur with an airbrush and created areas of light and dark such as spots and stripes to make the animal look as if it might have during its winter phase when a lot of mammals uh, gray down and try to look less noticeable when they're hunting prey. So this is uh, something that I created to uh, used when I was doing saber tooth cats. Actually, I think I'll leave the uh, skin version like this. It's a little bit more interesting to see. So, uh, so we have some props that we'll use. At any rate, I'm going to start working on this right now. And Alana, if you have any questions, just jump in if I've forgotten anything or there's something you want to know. Um, the brushes I'm using are a variety of brushes, such as uh, what we call a flat brush, obviously it's flat in shape, but I can get a very nice uh, kind of a hard edge on it if I want. I have a variety of these. This is my big one that I use for many different things. But I have quite a few smaller brushes that I use for details. Uh, so these are all watercolor brushes and um, they come in a variety of uh, shapes and sizes, but using brights and pointeds as well as flats are desirable. And um, what I'll be doing is uh, starting off with creating my basic area of um, tonality and shadow with a somewhat small brush at first just to get it in here. The nice thing about brushes is that you can make them as wet as you want. But basically what I'm doing is creating for myself a reminder of where I want my basic shapes to go so that when I start to lay in my tonalities, Mark, could you um, discuss what color you use and could you also oh. give us a view of your palette and how you set that up for us? Uh, yes, uh, let's see if I can get the palette not to, uh, not no, to. Don't spill anything, but. <laughs> spill. But uh, anyway, this is a standard uh, palette. It's, uh, I won't tip it anymore because things that's will. Fine. That's fine, that's perfect. Anyway, it's, a, it's the kind of palette that you can readily buy from an art department and of course now uh, because so many art stores are closed we have to be able to order these online but if you google uh, art materials you'll find a variety of different palettes uh, this being a, a very 
a very uh, sturdy uh, metal uh, covered with uh, baked enamel. So it will last a long, long time. And then you can also use just your uh, average kitchen plates, which I do. I have some very old dining uh, plates that I've used in the studio when I want something smaller that doesn't take up as much room on my desk. And then just as you start with the next, you know, with a color, just give us a little. Uh... Oh, yes, I, I didn't tell you about the colors. Um, what I'm creating for the monochromatic rendering is a combination of two colors. Um, one that I like to work with quite a bit is um, one that's called sepia. And again, these are uh, gouache or designer's colors, S-E-P-I-A, and it's a type of brown. It's kind of a neutral dark brown. And then also I'm working in combination with this with yellow ochre. So I can just give you a quick idea about what this looks like by taking someplace like the ear and if it will cooperate with me there. It's a kind of a, a brownish color, kind of a little bit light, but not too light and a little bit dark. Um, so this is the kind of color combination I'm using. So it gives me a neutral sort of a look when I'm re uh, creating the monochrome rendering, which is why it's called that. So um, let me just uh, speed up a little bit by using this flat brush. And laying in some of my basic tonalities. You can see that I can get variety in the um, kind of uh, tonality I get by using the brush on its edge or by using it in a flat way, which is a very nice thing. So I can make it work a little bit like a pencil or a uh, Conte stick in some ways. But the advantage of using a, uh, a bright or a flat brush like this is that I can cover fairly large areas in a in a brief period of time. Also, I can get some nice preliminary textures going. You can see how that's starting to work out. Incidentally, here's our corny little um, indication of light, which I often do uh, in starting out, because when you're working on a complicated series of shapes with a lot of animals, for example, uh, it's easy to lose track of the light source. And so, Sometimes reminding yourself that this is a good idea. The nice thing, of course, about the gouache or the designer's colors is that I can re-blend it, uh, as you see here. Now, one thing I can also do is to take something like a squeegee um, and then actually wet my entire image. And the advantage of this is, is that it makes the illustration board, which I'm using here, wet. So you can see that by virtue of it being wet, I can cover big areas really quickly and I can get some very nice blends going. Uh, this, in, uh, in addition, is why I like to use designer's gouache rather than acrylics when I'm working. But there are some artists who are extremely good at using acrylics. So it doesn't mean that we shouldn't use it, but um, I like it because I can keep blending and blending and blending. Um, also, if you have your, uh, your drawing board, such as the one I showed you, it doesn't matter if the colors that you put down on the drawing board dry up, because if you just use a squeegee or just drip water on them, your little um, blobs of color will reconstitute, they'll get wet again. So. Um, I could walk away from the drawing board and come back in another incarnation 500 years from now and just put a little water on there and I could still continue my rendering. With acrylic on the other hand, it would uh, dry solid and that would be it. Even though there are uh, retardants that you could put on acrylic that will keep them from drying quite as fast.
keeping in mind my light source, I'm just going ahead and uh, quickly laying in some of these basic tonalities to create the illusion of the dimensional shape. In working with a brush, of course, it lends itself to the kind of uh, textures you may already want, such as fur, feathers, or maybe uh, vegetation. Uh, I always keep even my rattiest old brushes because sometimes these, uh, even though they're in bad shape, actually can create a very nice texture that I want under given situations. Also, I sometimes keep an equally ratty uh, old sponge. And if I want to, if I get too much pigment on something, I can use the sponge to dab it down. I can even sort of erase with a sponge uh, on a nice surface like this. This is, um, by the way, two-ply illustration board, which was made by Bainbridge Company. And of course, you can order this just as you can any other uh, art supply. But it gives you uh, a very nice workable surface because a great deal of it is made of um, uh, rag, uh, not just paper. So when it's uh, formulated, it uh, creates a surface that absorbs paint very well, and yet it doesn't get all disintegrate and uh, kind of uh, ragged if you overwork it too much. It's a very forgiving sort of a surface, but if I wanted to, I could also take a piece of plywood and sand it off and then use a material called gesso, uh, uh, G-E-S-S-O, uh, cover it with a roller, let it dry, and then sand it, and then keep on doing that till I get a very smooth coating. So I've worked on materials like um, pine board before when I've been doing very large murals that were over the dimensions um, that you have available for illustration board, six feet and more. So you can work on surfaces like this by applying gesso, letting it dry, sanding it, and then you can work on it just like I'm doing now. Keeping in mind, I've got things like the uh, ears, which are casting shadows. Mark, could you speak a little bit to the um, body covering around the neck? Do we know if saber cats had a ruff like a lion? Or I see that you're working on the fur around there. Is there any science yeah. information pertaining to that? No, to answer your question, um, they, we really don't know, Alana. Um, uh, there has been an area um, uh, in one of the caves in East Europe uh, in Romania, in which uh, fur from a uh, step lion has been discovered. It was kind of a brindled yellowy, yellowy brown color. But so far, um, we don't know whether we have any saber tooth cat uh, evidence of fur or not. Uh, there have been some uh, wisps of fur that have come out of the uh, Labrea tar pits, but um, this was some time ago, and I don't know whether any DNA studies have ever been done to determine. Uh, whether uh, these came from a cat, a saber tooth, a lion, or so forth. Uh, hair is a very good preserver of DNA. However, having been immersed in a, uh, uh, a uh, oily asphalt kind of a medium like that, it may have degraded the DNA so much that uh, uh, we don't really know what it came from. Uh, one of the problems, of course, with DNA is that it does deteriorate very quickly, although there is some possibility that uh, it preserves for many, many millions of years. Uh, there have been some uh, DNA fragments that have come from uh, uh, hadrosaur ductile dinosaurs uh, that uh, possibly have some uh, protein preservation going on. Uh, so uh, it, it may be that these could be preserved, but uh, generally, uh, hair doesn't preserve very well under those conditions. But my big dream is that someday we'll uh, come across a cave or someone will come across it in which 
a perfectly mummified saber-toothed cat to be preserved down to the color and the pattern and everything else. Um, one thing that came very close to this was um, oh, something about maybe 20 or 25 years ago in which a um, Tasmanian wolf or thylacine was actually discovered uh, in a um, uh, area in uh, southwestern Australia called the uh, Null Arbor Plain. And uh, so the animal had fallen in there 500 years ago, not thousands and thousands of years ago, and uh, been perfectly mummified. And so, of course, we had all of its fur and everything else. Now, this was a uh, species that only recently, it's thought, became extinct. Um, so it looked pretty much like a uh, taxidermy specimen of a uh, Tasmanian wolf that we have around now. But uh, you can only hope it's possible that uh, that uh, maybe a prehistoric animal, tens of thousands of years old, um, could be preserved in a really complete form. And we do get um, the uh, fur preservation in some cases of a giant brown slope in uh, some caves in um, Patagonia in South America that have pretty good uh, samples of fur and skin, including some of the uh, uh, bony nodules that served the giant ground slopes as armor. So uh, as I say, you can only hope that something like this might be preserved. So I've put in my first layer of wash. Now I've got a, a darker layer that I can start laying in for some of these deeper shadows. So I have this pre-mixed. And so what color are you working with now? Is it the what same? What I'm working with is a darker version of the, uh, uh, of the sepia and the uh, uh, yellow ochre that I showed you before. It's, it looks darker simply because it's more concentrated. But uh, this, these are exactly the same colors. And again, at this point, when I'm doing the cat, I'm not particularly interested in uh, color right now, even though, of course, in doing a finished one, I will be. But uh, mainly, I'm interested in dimensionality and making something that will, that will pop off the page. Uh, color, uh, of course, for all its importance, is really good. But um, dimensionality of form is also very important, too. So that's why I usually go for this kind of a thing first. Again, this may not show up very well, but you can see on the um, on the um, uh, right of the screen the uh, lighter wash that I've been using, and on the left is the darker wash. But uh, this wash is composed of only two colors. So by limiting yourself in terms of your color use, uh, you can consider getting the dimensionality of the form first before you start to worry about color. And as I say, no matter how uh, ratty your brush may look after a number of years, don't throw it away because it may give you the kind of texture um, that you want to be able to create something like fur or feathers. Okay, having um, kind of gotten in A lot of the uh, a lot of the basic area of the form of the uh, head. I'm going to go for details like the eyes.
keeping in mind that uh, things like my highlight are going to be facing the, the light source. Cats have a um, interesting little uh, paisley or apostrophe like area of fur just to the inner and um, uh, top of the head that goes over the eye and from these actual whiskers come out as well as the whiskers that are coming off the bed. So these great, give great character to the animal's uh, appearance and probably saber tooths have this sort of thing too. They also have areas like eyelashes, very short small ones, which you'll see if you look at your cat, if you've got one. I was studying Sam's eyelashes just a little last week at one point. He has very elegant little black ones that come out of this corner of his upper eyelids. Big cats and probably saber cats as well uh, have very distinctive areas of uh, dark skin that come down from their eyes too. And things like cheetahs, these go way down and continue as a fur pattern. And this is probably where the ancient Egyptians got the distinctive kind of uh, eye stripes that you see on some of their masks and mummies. Mark, you were uh, mentioning in your last uh, discussion about how you add details to the midtones, not necessarily to the highlights or lowlights. Is that a principle that stands on this uh, lesson as well? Uh, yes, it, um, I can show that in just a minute, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's very important. Uh, this is a good time to show this, if I can get the right kind of a mixture on my brush. Sometimes what I do to my brush is to actually squeeze it a little bit, squeeze it apart, because then each fiber of the brush acts as a uh, device to render. So in areas where I want to get tail going on, such as the area from some of these rounded areas to the shadow, I can start using that. And by the amount of pressure that I exert on my brush, I can make it very light or I can make it very dark like that. Hopefully this is all showing up. A lot of cats have a distinctive light area right underneath the eye, which probably reflects light up into the eye. And it's probably the reason why it looks that way. And just put in some of these little areas of detail. And again, it's the area that goes in between the darkest or core shadow and the highlight or medium area. In some ways, using a uh, semi-dry brush is almost like drawing. It has almost the same quality because you're creating uh, very much like cross-hatching, the illusion of tonality by the way you use your brush. Let's put in some of these really long Sylvester rups in here.
if you ever have a chance to um, get a fabric that is like false fur, it's really handy to have this because you can um, actually take it in your hands and move it around and it will show you in what way real skin or, and real fur would actually respond to stretching and compression because of course in areas like um, this part of the well, part of the neck that goes around a cylindrical area like a head uh, you get uh, splits that would start to occur because the uh, fabric and the hair is stretching so it's really handy if you could ever possibly get something like this sometimes mm -hmm. you can find it at a store um, a lot of uh, coats have uh, false fur on it that uh, kind of give that impression of it We keep some of the uh, tone off to get the illusion of kind of a shiny naked nose area. Part of the reason I did that was because I want a uh, smooth gradated tone on this uh, saber or uh, right canine. So uh, wetting this gives me a nice smooth blend like this. All right, uh, I wanted to show, since I have the uh, monochrome rendering fairly underway, uh, this very nice book, uh, which is uh, The Cast in Action by Walter Foster. It's quite an old book now, but hopefully they still have it in print. And uh, it has this very nice page showing various types of uh, uh, renderings that he's done in a wet medium. Uh, and this gives you some idea about the uh, variety of uh, colors in cats uh, for any of the uh, viewers who would like to start working on their own prehistoric animals. Uh, living animals have a great deal of variety. Also, as you see from the renderings, he's positioned the heads in different ways to elicit different uh, uh, expressions, different moods in the cat's uh, hostility or calmness or something like that. Also, you can see down here where I'm pointing the way he has started actually creating the um, rendering by doing a light pencil drawing and then darkening it. He didn't have to take quite a, take it quite as far as he did as the tiger that's on the um, right, but it gives you some idea of how to start a drawing. Um, starting very light is usually advisable, especially when you're going to be doing a monochromatic rendering like this, because you're actually using the uh, wet tone to create your sense of light and dark. So you need to take the drawing as far as some of the things in here. Let me just work on this a little bit more, and then uh, there are a couple of more things I wanted to show you if we uh, have time for that a lot. I just realized the ear needs a lot of uh, light and dark going on just for fun and giving in bobcat tufts i just like to do this with saber tooths even though we really have no idea about whether they have this or not it's possible that mother saber tooths had little light colored areas on their ears for the cubs to follow when they were out 
um, in the bush, uh, the way tigers do. You can see how I'm creating a um, feeling of uh, dimensionality in something like the ear by using dark and light tones that gradually come into a highlighted area like this. Give this eye a little bit of dimension. In creating the eye, I'm thinking of the idea that uh, basically the eyes around object is responding to light in um, two ways. Basically, it's catching light on the surface that's closest to the light source. But then as the light source comes away, it uh, gradually bleeds light and it becomes lighter and lighter, whereas the areas that are closest or far, excuse me, farthest away from the light are going to get darker. And you want to make sure that you develop your areas equally as you're working on it. There's a, a lip of skin that catches the light. So we want to do it on both of those. And then of course, with this very fine brush, I can really go in and do some super detailing on the, uh, on the eyes. keeping in mind that the highlight is going to actually bounce off the most on this curved surface. I don't want my highlight to get too close to the edge. So I'm just taking this down a little bit. So now I've got the um, dark and white areas fairly well established. What happens if I want to go in and start creating some, some details like the eyelashes? Well, I've gotten this pretty dark, but what I can go in and do is, since I'm using an opaque paint, I can go in and lighten this up if I want. Also, you can see how, because this has a little bit more of the yellow ochre in it, as well as orange, I can start creating this dimensional quality of um, the middle tone. So Mark, what color are you using in here? Uh, the colors I'm using here are, uh, let me see, 
are more of the yellow ochre, but just a little bit of the uh, orange as well, just to give it a little bit of warmth, as well as some of the uh, sepia tone that I had been using in the beginning. And uh, I'll just work around the eye here. create more of a middle tone. I sometimes like to use my finger when I'm working. It just is sort of a quick way of blending. I could use a sponge and I could also use uh, a brush as well. But there's something satisfying about the tactility of working personally with your fingers on something like this. I've just always liked it. So I try not to have really greasy fingers so I get oil on it. So as you're pushing these um, mid-tone colors, is there anything that people should um, be careful about uh, maybe going too far with the mid-tones and losing those highlights? Are there particular areas that need you to- You can go too far and lose the mid-tones. Um, however, because gouache uh, can be reworked endlessly, um, don't be afraid of doing that. Um, I also suggest to my students that it's far better to overwork a rendering than uh, be really afraid of it and underwork it because you're afraid that you're gonna mess something up. Um, don't be afraid of making mistakes. Here what I'm doing is actually erasing a little bit some of my, some of my middle tone that I put in to create more of the feeling of roundness in that uh, uh, cheekbone area, but it's, um, it's something that you can always go back in and do. Uh, here's a, uh, an illustration of what you could do if you wanted to cover over some of that middle tone. You see that because my, my brush is, uh, my paint load is very opaque, I can create some of this um, feathery look by using very light pigment, which covers the dark that I did. Let me uh, pick this up and show you. Hopefully this shows up a little bit. But you can see where I just worked some of those uh, light brush strokes introduced uh, opaque uh, paint over the area that was formerly dark. Let's go back to the side for a minute. If we were to take this a lot farther and I were to use more and more colors in it, if, for example, I wanted to make it look uh, like a sort of a buffy uh, brown or yellow color, we might end up with something like this, which is a rendering of Megan Trion, uh, saber tooth cat relative. And this is a, uh, what I would call a finished rendering. And you'll see more of these in the uh, renditions of the Nimravid Sabertooth that uh, Nick and Alana have as stills. But it would end up looking like something like this. Naturally, we'd have um, colors like some green for the eyes and some pink. But in some areas, like the, uh, like the uh, portion of the um, shadow, I might like to use some green in there or some purple to make these visually go back in space. Uh, here's another example 
uh, this is a book cover, excuse me, a book cover that I made. Here's a uh, drawing that I did for a book cover for a Canadian company that did a book about saber tooths. And this is the way it ended up. So here you've got a complete rendering with uh, all the stops pulled out for dimensionality and shadow and light using uh, cooler values to make the colors go back and warmer ones like yellows and oranges to make areas like the head come forward. Obviously we need references when we're doing something like the um, realistic version of an animal. And um, there's some really good ones out there. Obviously we can all Google uh, references and see them online. Uh, here's a book, however, that I think is very helpful for you to get if you can. It's um, simply entitled Cat, and it's part of the so-called Eyewitness series of books. But it has uh, marvelous pictures of um, cats that show um, photos with uh, excellent uh, fur texture and other things the tails of the whisker, the tails of the uh, mouth and other things. So if you can get references like this, as well as clippings from magazines, let's say an ad for cat food might have a very, very good uh, rendition of a cat on it, a good photo. Clip these out and save them and start making yourself a little notebook, as well as the little notebook of your own drawings, because this will really help you when you're uh, trying to create something like a realistic rendition of an animal. I also wanted to suggest a marvelous book that you'll have a lot of fun reading. It's called Sabretooth by Mauricio Antone. And you can see what uh, wonderful work Mauricio does. He is a Spanish artist, illustrator, and paleontologist, as well as an author who lives and works in Madrid, Spain. And um, Mauricio is probably the world's greatest authority on sabretooth cats. His illustrations are wonderful, and uh, he has discovered a lot about their biology as well. So if you want something really fun to read, uh, it will uh, uh, eliminate you about Sabretooth. Get Sabretooth by Mauricio Antone by Indiana University Press. I think this just came out a few years ago, but it's truly a wonderful book. Let me just uh, put in a few more dark areas in here, and then I think probably we'll pretty much have yeah, and Mark, we'll, we'll do a reading list for everybody or a, a materials list. We'll, we'll do a, a full thing for everyone, so. Okay, so let me just give him a little bit of, a little bit of uh, dark value going on here. And you're doing the darks in just a darker, more opaque version of the a darker and more opaque version of the, uh, of the uh, two colors that I, that I showed you before, the yellow ochre and the sepia color. Hope the um, lawn mowing activities that are going on outside aren't drowning things out too much at this point. Nick was just asking me if I heard it. <laughs> this is our day to get our our big meadow mown is uh, prevented against fire. So we do this every two weeks.
So can you discuss the whisk whisker bed a little bit more in terms of its scientific uh, importance? Is it a bit larger on these cats because of their savers or is it more similar to uh, extent animals? Well, the whisker bed that I'm working on now uh, probably was not much, um, not much bigger, but it was probably a little bit deeper to cover uh, part of the uh, uh, saber up when the animal wasn't using it. Uh, it's quite possible that um, that some of the uh, mucosal area and uh, skin may have extended both farther forward from the back of the mouth and farther backward from the front of the mouth to maybe cover a lot of it up because when the mouth is open and the animal is actively um, pressing the uh, sabers into its prey, uh, it would have been exposed. But in the meantime, it's possible that, uh, that a, a mucosal area of skin may have actually protected the uh, enamel from drying out and uh, protected it uh, from um, injury like being knocked or bumped that would have uh, possibly even shattered or broken the sabers. So it's, it's probably that it was maybe, maybe a right one. It might have been a little bit uh, deeper going from top to bottom, but probably not too much uh, in terms of uh, from front to back. So Mark, do you think this is a male cat or a female cat, or do we know the differences? Oh, uh, I, uh, I honestly haven't thought about that. Um, my assumption is that uh, like living cats, uh, if it was a male, it would have been larger. Um, usually in animals like uh, jaguars and tigers, the head of a male cat is much larger. It's much more uh, deep and robust, kind of the way it is on a human being. In a male, the way males of our species usually have uh, longer uh, jaws and more robust bone structure. Um, so I, I'm thinking that in all likelihood a male would have been more robust in the case of a saber cat like a tiger. However, there are mammals in which the female is bigger, uh, like blue whales, for example. The female is maybe about 15% bigger than a male. Uh, in the case of birds of prey, female eagles are bigger than males, possibly for the reason that uh, males would uh, require fewer calories when they're bringing prey back to the nest so that they could bring a prey out and like a, a dead rabbit to the female and it would be able to uh, feed itself and its young. Uh, whereas if the male was bigger, it would eat more food and require more calories. So uh, there's absolutely no way of knowing with the with the these kinds of mammals, but I, I'm guessing that probably the males were bigger. Uh, we don't have enough of uh, a preserved database of uh, fossils to see if there are any uh, osteological or bony differences between, between a male and a female. I just uh, really don't know. There, there could be something on the way, but um, I'm guessing that males just would have been bigger and heftier the way tomcats are in our, our own kitties. One thing I'm doing with my brush is uh, starting on the bottom in the deepest shadow and allowing the brush to gradually fan out to a uh, lighter wash 
in order to keep that highlight that I want. Am I imagining it or is there a little bit more color going into the neck right now? Oh, I'm using some of the um, some of the yellow ochre with a little bit of the orange. It's actually uh, a little bit uh, a little bit more intense on this. Someone unintentionally. But um, usually uh, color is best reserved for the or more intense color is best reserved for the areas that are closer to the viewer. However, another um, uh, idea about using uh, gouache is that uh, dries with what we call an illustration a tooth or a uh, slightly rough surface. It's basically a little bit more than the um, illustration board that it's on, unlike acrylic that has a more glossy, smoother finish. And to this effect, you can use things like after the paint is dry, you could things like um, uh, pastels, which are uh, basically one way of augmenting the color that you've got going on already. What I like to do is to keep a little tray like this with a uh, file, and I actually take the pastel and I um, and I scrape some of it off, and I then use things like uh, French stumps or paper stumps that have tissue covering it. Or if you want, you can just use something like a cotton swab and actually take it and, uh, and be able to change the, um, change the tonality. For example, here it's dry and I want a little bit more of an intense reddish color. So what I sometimes do when I want more intense color is to take my uh, my pastel and rub it in because the tooth or the roughness of the um, illustration work will take this very nicely. And since the paint is dry, you can see how I'm getting a much more intense uh, kind of ready brown color going on. I can also take things like um, just ordinary tissue and rub it to get the effect too. If I don't want as much of it, if I want to take some of that out, I could just take an eraser and remove it like this. So, you can kind of erase when you're using pastel, just as you can erase quote unquote by using a dry brush and a uh, sponge to take out some of your um, unwanted, uh, really intense color. But uh, at this point, I would really develop it quite a bit more before I went in and tried to uh, take out some color. Give the eye a little bit color going. Now, even though I've left my uh, my highlight unpainted, I could take in with some go in with some white and really get that a nice highlight. highlight on the tooth. Doesn't really need it because I've got my highlight here, but you can see how you can actually achieve something like this.
ready to go. Sure. Yes, I'm ready to go. Well, here we are back again at uh, Smilodon's place, and um, uh, I'm just adding on a few whiskers as the last touch. And uh, you can see that I, in the interim, put some detail into areas that uh, are starting to wrap around forms like the cheekbone, the top of the nose, the whisker bed, the um, side ruffs in the neck to show that uh, we have some uh, fore and aft areas that are starting to pop out. Mark, so can you discuss what uh, color and what type of brush you're using to lay down this paint, how, how thick the paint is on the brush, things like that? Yes, in this case, um, that's a good question. Uh, I'm using a much more opaque mixture of paint on the brush, which in this case, it's unfortunately worn off. But um, when it was uh, brand new, it used to be a very nicely pointed um, uh, bright, brush with a with a tip probably i would say a um, a number uh, one or two um, small brushes like this go down to as fine a point as uh, triple aught or aught which is two zeros or three zeros um, and so you can get them absolutely as fine as you want some artists actually like to use a thicker brush even though it has a more of a paint load on it if they have a very fine tip I, however, prefer to use a smaller paint load on a finer tip just because I like the amount of control. But um, I think that uh, the best brands are Windsor Newton, which makes red sable brushes made of the sable from, uh, made of the hair from uh, red sables like mink. However, you can get uh, uh, cheaper brushes that are made from squirrel and other things. Uh, you can even get synthetic brushes in which the bristles are plastic. But red saber tends to be the uh, red sable, excuse me, tends to be the um, absolute best brush that you can get in terms of the quality of the way the uh, bristles perform. Uh, but these brushes will literally last you a lifetime if you take care of them. And uh, I've been guilty of not taking care of them before, but uh, if you do as I say and not do as I do, you'll have a fine, fine brush for many, many years. Just giving them a few little details. And of course, he needs to have whiskers on the other side too. So since we're working against a white background, these can only show up by going the other way with a, uh, with a darker wash. Could you bring the board uh, forward a little bit Certainly. so we might be able to see that detail? Wow, cool. Thank you. Normally I wouldn't work this large, but uh, we wanted it to show up. So I hope this has given everyone a, a good idea of how to work with a wet medium and the brushes. Uh, a very, very telescoped process in this case, but um, it's really exciting to be able to share this with everyone because I love painting. It's very relaxing, as you found, Alana. Uh, so I suggest to everyone that they uh, try using a wet medium. And uh, I would suggest, if I can, using 
gouache or designer's colors will give you a lot more range of um, uh, handleability than um, something like acrylic. But if you like acrylic, please go ahead and use that. There are other things you can do as well. So uh, uh, just to finish off, it's been such a pleasure to share this with everyone. And thanks so much for giving me the chance. Thanks so much to Silver Plume and to Nick and Alana for engaging me in doing this. Take care, guys.